to this Jobs AC UK recording about working in an Australian university as part of your academic career. After listening to our audience, we discovered a lot of uncertainty surrounding the process for a UK academic to relocate and work in the Australian higher education sector. We have been collecting your questions and concerns about this and we approached two academics who have gone through the process themselves. Over the next 30 minutes, Karen Strickland and Patrick Crooks will answer your questions and share their own experiences about relocating to Australia and we hope you find this information useful. Over to them. Hello and welcome to this conversation about relocating from the UK to Australia um, in higher education. My name is Professor Karen Strickland. I'm Professor of Nursing and Head of School in the School of Nursing, Midwifery and Public Health at the University of Canberra. Hello, my name is Patrick Crooks. I'm a professor in nursing in the same school. Okay. Um, we thought we could just start by um, telling you a little bit about our own journeys um, and then some, address some of the questions that have been posed. So I moved from um, Scotland um, about nine months ago um, to um, take up this position as a joint clinical chair. Um, with the University and uh, the ACT Health. Um, the, the way this job came about came through Headhunters, um, which is um, quite common in higher education, um, where they interview first um, and screen potential candidates um, for roles. Um, and then I was interviewed via Skype. Um, that seems to be more common these days, interviewing via Skype um, rather than flying out. Um, but I did fly out with my family for a visit ahead of taking up position. Um, and that was something that was part funded by the university. Um, I think in practical terms, some of the, th some of the questions have been related to visas. Um, and again, I'll share my experience um, around the type of visa that I, uh, I am on, um, but I would recommend that you have a chat with um, a specialist visa lawyer. Um, so there were two options when I was relocating here uh, in Australia. And the first option was um, at the time a 457 visa, which was a temporary visa for four years. Um, or uh, an employer-nominated permanent residence visa, um, which takes a bit longer to be granted and go through the system, but that's the visa that I opted for. Um, and I'll tell you why that's the case. Um, with the temporary residence visa, um, in my own research, I found out that um, there were certain restrictions um, if I came on the temporary residence visa. Um, and I have young school aged children and that was one of the biggest factors for me um, because if you come over on a temporary residence visa then you can be liable for school fees um, even in the public system but also you might be liable for some medical, uh, medical bills as well. But as an academic there was another consideration as well in that when you're applying for grants some of the grants, um, even the kind of uh, charitable organisation grants, actually require you to be either an Australian citizen or permanent resident. Um, so if I had come over on the 457 temporary residence visa, then it would have restricted the grants that I would be able to apply for. So I, um, in discussion with my employers, um, we opted for the permanent residence visa. Um, they, they did um, send a letter to the immigration department to have that um, expedited, but it, it, can take, um, it can take several months um, to go through. Um, so that was, that was one of the, the key considerations for me, but I would strongly recommend that you, you talk to um, a specialist visa lawyer. Now, I was fortunate, having been offered the position here, um, the university appointed um, visa lawyers and they helped me through that process. And I think that's something that you need to clarify quite early on, whether you'll be afforded that, um, that service by the university or whether you have to um, source your own visa lawyer. Um, it's quite a significant benefit um, to have that um, facility. Um, 
Gordon and I'm Gordon. Okay. Um, my story is substantially different um, because um, I emigrated to Australia um, in 1989. So I've been in Australia almost 30 years. Um, and uh, it wasn't associated with it directly. We, my wife and I decided that we wanted to emigrate um, soon after we got married. But um, um, what we uh, found was at the time we wanted to apply was the time of the bicentenary in 1987, 88. And um, so it took us probably two years to actually get permission to move out on a, a permanent residency visa. And so uh, we, we actually applied and came out to Australia having had our nursing qualifications assessed by the relevant um, institution over here that then meant that we um, emigrated on a, a skilled migrant visa. And um, it's quite clear that um, the, the, the government and the systems here still see that as the preferred way for skilled migrants to migrate. That's obviously not um, feasible when you're in the sort of situation that I assume the vast majority of you are and that Karen found herself in. So I think Karen's advice about um, her experience of um, applying for a job and then seeking support from the university in terms of um, um, visas and all that sort of stuff is, is, very, is very good advice and pertinent advice. Something to be aware of though is that um, in some circumstances the perception in some universities at least is that that, that can be quite long and drawn out and um, I was recently involved in a recruitment uh, process as an external um, reviewer if you like uh, um, on a, a senior appointment to another university and a decision was made quite early on not to shortlist um, a couple of people from the UK basically because the perception was it would take too long and there was a good chance that um, potentially people wouldn't be able to um, get registered and therefore come over here and therefore um, wouldn't meet the criteria so the decision was not to waste time. Um, I think that, that that's particularly the case for people who are in uh, disciplines that are governed by the Australian Health Practitioners Registering Agency or APRA, which is the uh, umbrella body for health professional registration across Australia, and that covers, I think, mm -hmm. 15 um, professions, and um, they are quite influential in um, one's ability to actually migrate using your qualifications. And so, one of the things I'd encourage you to do as well, looking at um, visa lawyers and migration agents is to consider if you do have a health professional background or perhaps if you have a teaching background that you look at the relevant um, web pages for the registering authorities um, and some of those things are still state level state state teacher education and registration is at a state level but health professional registration is now at a national level for about the last six or seven years and um, they have all sorts of regulations about English language competency, etc., etc., and um, and the level of qualifications, and that can significantly affect one's ability to migrate. I think um, some of the other things that are a little bit different um, that I didn't anticipate. Um, and a few people have asked these questions, is around um, some of the terms and conditions. Um, I had heard about this, you know, amazing Aussie work-life balance and laid-back um, way of being, um, and it's actually quite different. Um, in the UK, I was used to um, seven weeks paid leave a year, um, plus public holidays, um, and uh, sick leave should I require of uh, six months half pay and six months uh, full pay. Um, however, in here, um, it's a bit different. Um, it tends to be about four weeks paid leave, and they call it re recreational leave, 
Um, but there are quite a number of public holidays um, and even one for the Queen's birthday, which I did find quite strange since we don't have a public holiday for the Queen's birthday back in the UK. But there you go, um, you get one here in, in, in Australia. The way that any sick pay is, um, uh, it is accrued. Um, so the longer you're in service, you accrue an entitlement to paid what they call personal leave, not, not sick leave. Um, and so, so that's something to consider, um, particularly if you do have some health conditions. Um, but through the Uni Super, which is the, the pension um, scheme, there are things like you know protect income protection um, and critical illness cover and you're recommended to take those sorts of things out but again you would need to speak to a specialist to discuss your individual circumstances. Um, Can I add something about yeah. superannuation yeah. then? What, one of the things that I think um, historically was quite significantly different since the mid to late 80s uh, was that Australia became a place at that time um, where superannuation was strongly uh, encouraged and now it's mandatory that uh, one has a superannuation fund. Um, the, the, the Australian, uh, until recently, you were forced to be in certain funds if your employer required you to be so. Um, that that protection is now being removed and people have much more choice about which super fund they want to be in. But the, the fund that uh, the vast majority of people in universities are here is called Unisuper. Um, it's what's called an industry fund and therefore the contributions and the funds raised from it um, are reinvested back into the fund. It's not a commercial fund, mm -hmm. so it doesn't pay sh shareholders. Mm -hmm. The implication is that that, that fund does quite well. Mm -hmm. And um, I would have to say that compared to my family back in the UK, the, the sorts of superannuation um, nest eggs that build up over here in Australia is significantly different and bigger, particularly in funds associated with um, mm -hmm. higher education, um, professional staff and academics. Mm -hmm. In part, that is, is because of the um, employer contributions on top of the contributions that individuals can make. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that that's a real positive about Australia. I think the other thing you'd find is if you, if you drill down and look at um, uh, relative salaries, the salaries here are significantly uh, higher, mm -hmm. although over the last probably four to five years, the cost of living has also gone up compared to the UK. So that, that eats into some of that. But um, the salaries is, are quite significantly higher here mm -hmm. than they are in the UK, I would say, mm -hmm. although we have had significant uh, wage freezes here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think another positive thing, just as a positive thing for me about um, salaries in Australia is that it's, I think it's quaintly Australian, but I love it, it in that we get paid every fortnight. Mm. <laughs> we don't, you, so you don't have those um, interminable months where there's five and a half weeks and you're wondering what's gonna happen for the last four days of it or whatever, which is how I found myself with a young family many years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Fortnightly salary is really good. And it does mean that things like um, uh, bills, like rent, okay. mortgage, car loans, the whole system set up that you can pay fortnightly as well. So it's it's uh, it's really quite positive. That's a, that also flows through to home loans. Yeah. And what, what what is the case here? Home loans are much more affordable because of the way that interest is calculated. Mm -hmm. And so people who make fortnightly payments can pay off their 25 year mortgage uh, maybe three, four years earlier. Mm -hmm. it, it makes that level of difference based on how mm -hmm. um, uh, interest is calculated and paid. Yeah. While we're on finances, somebody asked a question about pensions, um, how it works and transferring pensions. Um, there was a law passed in the UK a couple of years ago, I checked this out before I moved, and you can't actually, you cannot transfer your UK pension anymore to um, Australia. So your pension does get frozen in the UK. Um, but you can keep track of that and get annual um, statements on your pension. Um, so it's just a case of getting in touch with um, your um, pensions office um, and having a discussion about that. that. That's about personal pension, isn't it? That was No, that was my, um, uh, it was the Scottish teacher's pension. That yeah, I was that's in. what I mean, yeah. that was in your superannuation yeah, fund. Superannuation. In terms of yeah. the old age pension, 
one mm -hmm. of the other things that um, pensioners, mm -hmm. people who are pensioners, complain about, who, particularly those who are older or who come over to Australia once they've retired, mm -hmm. is that the British government has um, a policy that for certain countries, Australia is one of them, when you leave, whatever your pension would have been or is on the day that you leave, mm -hmm. That's what you get for the rest for wherever you live in Australia, yeah. and Canada and South Australia, uh, South and uh, South Africa. There are other countries where it goes up like it would be as if yeah. you were a pensioner in the UK. But that is something that's something to be aware of because um, mm -hmm. uh, over time you you will find if you've made significant contributions to the age pension through a national insurance scheme, mm -hmm. um, you you don't receive that. Mm -hmm. In Australia, it's based on a means test, and good old Australian tax office taxpayer, they um, they actually make up the age pension for people who are in that situation. Because of the very heavy emphasis that's been in Australian universities for the past seven or eight years since we introduced the equivalent of the REF in the UK, we introduced it in Australia called excellence in research Australia so you'll you'll hear and see things relate to era mm -hmm. um, that's the exercise that the government uses to look at research excellence interestingly it has nothing to do with funding but mm -hmm. we all go through it um, that um, it, that means that most universities when they are recruiting actively and they start to look overseas is that they tend to be looking for people who are research active mm -hmm. and who will enhance the research quantum in the institution in the discipline in which they work. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest that the alternatives to that are in some disciplines related to health because it's it's becoming more and more difficult to recruit academics in those areas, not least because uh, people as they progress tend to see doing research as the way to um, achieve higher and, and achieve more status, therefore it's more difficult to persuade people to be involved in teaching and administration. Um, but, uh, and so in areas like, for example, nursing, to a lesser extent, midwifery, paramedicine, for example, um, there's really quite a shortage of experienced people and therefore, um, I would suggest that there would be more chance of getting a job than if, for example, you were in a, uh, had an arts background. Um, I'm very sensitive to that because my daughter's just graduated with a PhD in, um, in English literature. Mm. That That is associated in part with the fact that um, over the last probably 10 years, um, a, a quite significant issue that's arisen in Australian universities is the level of casualisation amongst academics. Mm. And in certain disciplines, um, uh, in terms of teaching, for example, 50 or 60% of teaching in a given discipline may well be done by casual and part-time teachers. So either people on a weekly contract or people who are contracted for a semester. Some of those may be post-grad, um, but some of them are people who, that, that's how they earn their living and it's quite a mm -hmm. precipitous uh, situation. Mm -hmm. And that has an impact on the number of jobs that uh, will be advertised in certain disciplines, because there's a, a fairly large group of people waiting for those positions to come up, if they come up. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say that um, for there's a significant emphasis on STEM and um, a real area of workforce shortage is in um, experienced teachers to teach STEM in schools and therefore if you are an educator who educates people to teach in STEM so you're a teacher educator in those areas I would suggest that uh, there'd be a number of universities looking for experienced people in that sort of, with that sort of background. Now, I was just um, just going through the list here, and, and one of the things, uh, interview norms and quirks, um, and even before that, um, CVs are a bit different here yeah. than I've experienced in the UK, and I did a lot of recruitment in the UK in my previous post as well, where the CV was pretty factual and pretty concise. But here in Australia, there is much more of a tendency for a very full CV, so under each um, job or even subsections within your job, so it might be research, teaching and consultancy, for example, 
um, it's it's expected for you to draw out um, some of the key responsibilities and key achievements under those um, under those areas, um, so that you know they get a real flavour of um, your experience um, and your level of uh, skill and competency. Um, some of the universities are moving away from um, fuller applications as well. Um, so this full CV um, is a way of getting over um, what you've done and what contribution you can make as well. Um, so I was quite um, uh, quite uh, surprised at the level of detail um, and the recruitment company that I was working with were actually really good at, at telling me that you needed a little bit more in here and also a colleague who was working over here in Australia suggested to me that I needed to put more of that information in because I was much more used to seeing these very factual, concise CVs um, in the UK. Um, and certainly through the recruitment that I've done here, um, you know, it's not uncommon to see a 30 page or more sometimes CV um, and that would just be a complete no-no in, uh, in the UK. I agree. I wouldn't encourage 30 pages. I think you should be including highlights, yeah. but some people feel the need to yeah. you know, vomit content into the CV. <laughs> I think the, uh, an added point for what Karen just said, though, is that um, it's very much the tendency in Australia to advertise and to put key criteria. Mm -hmm. And and what you, what you really need to be getting um, adept at is answering those key criteria, perhaps cross-referencing to certain mm -hmm. examples of things that are in the broader, more detailed CV. Mm -hmm. um, but but really keeping it down to two to three pages with, with short, sharp statements about how you believe you meet each of the criteria. Because um, Australia is a very popular place for people to apply to, and there are, there are actually a lot of time mm -hmm. wasters. Mm -hmm. And um, and so the shortlisting groups are, are, are looking for ways to say, well, in the first cut, um, yeah. who are the people who we yeah. can definitely um, exclude? And if you haven't appeared to bother to make any sort of attempt to briefly give an indication of how you believe you meet the criteria, one of the criteria will be, for initial rejection will be, this person didn't meet the. They didn't um, deal with the selection criteria, uh, and that's a real. That's a bigger issue than having a CV that's got superfluous information in it, because mm -hmm. people will look through that and then they'll go looking for those things in your CV. Mm -hmm. um, I've found that particularly from America and Canada, less so from the UK, but from America and Canada, it's it, it's not unusual for people to just send their CV and they mm -hmm. expect the panel to figure it out mm -hmm. and um, most panels here will say no nah, I can't be bothered with that mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. unless you've got a Nobel Prize or some other Fields Prize or something <laughs> yeah um, I suppose um, looking at the interview you know a Skype interview is quite different to um, being interviewed in person and certainly I was interviewed via Skype for this job and I've done quite a number of interviews as I'm sure you've done um, via Skype for people but you know very basic things like make sure that you're not disturbed um, I dressed myself as the way I would um, if I was being interviewed in person as well because it was an interview um, make sure that your dog is locked away. I recently interviewed someone whose dog jumped up and started licking their face and it was okay but um, it's much better for you as the candidate if you are undisturbed and uh, are quite relaxed and focused on the interview. Um, and take the time to you know work with the, um, it's usually an administrator that will set up your uh, interview appointment, so ask for a check of the technology. Um, to be sure that your um, Skype connection is going to work with um, with the interviewers um, and that's usually offered um, ahead of time of the interview so um, do take that opportunity. I think we, through our conversation, I think we've come to the end of the um, questions that we received 
uh, we're quite happy to receive any follow-up questions um, through the agency and uh, yeah. Aren't we? Yeah. 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 and um, it may be that um, when we look back through these questions we may identify some other points we also have a colleague um, in our HR department who uh, we uh, will probably record um, subsequently because she has um, a few points to make from an HR perspective about that may answer these questions in slightly more detail um, mm -hmm. but um, hopefully what we've been talking about you'll find mm -hmm. helpful and useful and um, we wish you all the best for your aspirations in yeah. your career and your aspirations to come and be an academic in Australia it, it, it's it's the best country on earth I'm, yeah, I'm the Greece. We hope you found this video helpful and that it answered the majority of your questions. If there is anything else you are unsure about, please send your questions to wegmarketing at warwick.ac.uk. We will be organising a follow-up Twitter live session about this, so please do follow us on social media for the latest information. We wish you all the best with your relocation plans.